okay, hello and welcome. Um, it's great to see just from there where we've, we've asked um, who, who you are and where some of you are from that we've actually got a really good diverse spread across um, the four home nations of coaches. It sounds like officials, athletes. I think we've got maybe a, a parent at all. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. So we're going to be providing um, you either as coaches or outside of that workforce group hopefully an opportunity to understand classification and the process a little bit more um, and mainly around that support that can be given to players that we hope will help manage expectations and really try and make classification a positive experience. So as Natalie kindly introduced to us, my name's Liz um, Fisher. I'm a national technical classifier and I'm also being joined by Fran Lace, who is a national medical classifier. So let's have a look at what we're going to be going through. Um, Fran and myself are going to be explaining why we classify, the structure, the process behind this and the outcomes. And we're really going to try and keep it relevant to that support network around the player, as I said, to manage those expectations around classifications. So please feel free to ask any questions either within the chat function or save them to the end and we will do our best to answer anything. So hopefully a good place to start is actually understanding why do we classify and especially why do we classify in Paralympic sport. So the classification system exists in each sport to create this idea of a fair competition and it's there to minimise the effect of disability on the outcome of competition. And the key thing here is that it really establishes who can and can't compete in Paralympic sport and will group an athlete into the sport classes for competition and that depends on how much impairment their, uh, sorry, how much their impairment impacts their functional activity. So it really means deciding who can and who can't compete in Paralympic sport and take part in that Paralympic pathway. So I'm going to try and play a video that's currently on YouTube and we'll share the link with this afterwards. Um, that's being produced by the National Paralympic Committee for Great Britain. And I'm hoping that it's quite a nice resource that either you can use, um, maybe if you're trying to share with an athlete or to help you with your understanding further after tonight. Um, so I'm going to do my best to share this. I say. Can we see that? OK. Yep, got that. <laughs> Classification is crucial to para sport. Without it, competitive sport is, right. is not possible or meaningful. It establishes who can and cannot compete and groups athletes into sport classes. Disabled people who are not eligible to compete at the Paralympic Games can continue to enjoy sport, but they are not on a Paralympic journey. The classification system of each sport is different, but its aim is always the same, to minimise the impact of someone's impairment on the outcome of competition. Classification might seem complicated, but so are people. No two para-athletes are completely identical. Athletes may look different to their competitors, as there is a spectrum of impairments in each class. To be classified, athletes must submit medical information, go through sport and impairment specific tests, and they may be observed in competition. During the classification process, athletes must give their best effort and a true reflection of their impairment. Athletes can choose someone to accompany them during this process. To enter a national competition, the athlete must go through national classification, run by the sport's national governing body. This should mirror international classification as much as possible. To enter an international competition, the athlete must undergo international classification, run by the sport's international federation. This outcome always overrules national classification. Classifiers work in panels of at least two and make decisions together. They decide which class an athlete competes in. They are trained by the International Federation of that sport and must have relevant professional qualifications. For example, they could be a physiotherapist or an ophthalmologist. 
intentional misrepresentation, where someone fakes their level of impairment is cheating. If it's proven, athletes or staff can face a maximum four-year ban. Comparing competition results, personal bests or season bests on its own is not evidence that an athlete has been misrepresenting their impairment. An athlete may change class for a number of reasons during their career. This does not mean that they were misrepresenting their impairment before they changed class. Depending on the nature of their impairment, an athlete could be classified multiple times during their career. An international federation can put an athlete through the classification process again if it thinks the athlete may have been given an incorrect class. Athletes may need to go through the classification process again when there are changes made to the sports classification rules. Classification isn't the key to success in para sport. Different factors that impact on performance include talent, training technique and good coaching. Athletes have successfully won gold medals despite being considered amongst the most impaired in their class. For further information, please visit our classification page at paralympics.org.uk. Perfect, and I'll just try and take us back to the... Uh... Here we go. Cool, so we're going to build a little bit, I guess, on some of the things that are touched on in that video um, and look at classification, um, trying to make it as specific to butcher as possible. But you see from that that classification happens across all para sports. Um, and some of the, well, a lot of the stuff that happens in butcher um, comes from that sort of centralized classification program, uh, which the IPC is involved with. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing process. And despite having that, that um, kind of, I suppose, the global guidelines from the IPC, um, it is also sport specific. So each sport has got really different activities and actions um, and what, how you're able to, to physically complete those actions will impact on your ability in that sport. Um, so if you're classified in one sport, then you and you start playing another sport, you'll need a new classification in that sport. Um, like the video said, the impact of the impairment um, needs to be considered when, you, when you're looking at classification. And the whole aim about classification is to minimise how, how an impairment affects your ability to be competitive. Perfect. So now that hopefully we understand a bit more about classification, we can look to apply that to botcha. So as you can see, the classification in botcha can take place at a self-classification, regional na level, national level and international level. Um, and this really helps us provide our structure for competition. So whilst we're not going to go into international level this evening, um, it's, it's worthwhile knowing, and you might have seen it on the video as well, that international classification will always overrule that of a national level. So we're going to start with number one, which is our self-classification. So this occurs um, right at the very start before regional classification. And it's the point for new athletes that are coming into the sport. So athletes can use the tools that are available through Home Nation websites. So we've got an example here from Scotland, Northern Ireland and England's um, infographics, we refer to them as, as to really identifying who can play, what does a botcher athlete look like um, for each of the Paralympic classifications, which are that of a BC1 to BC4. Um, and this is a self-classification will be done until a formal classification at regional level can be carried out. It's probably worth knowing that um, there will be another infographic through Botcher UK that will be available in the ne next month or so. But these ones currently exist and they're available for you to, to get access to. Some you can download and share and so on um, currently through each of the sports home nation websites. So whilst this is not a, an eligibility workshop that we're doing tonight, Northern Ireland have kindly allowed us to share and have a little bit more of a look um, at some of the eligible features of what a botcher player looks like in classifications B BC1 to 4. So you can obviously see on the screen some of the um, clear definitions, but 
I thought it might be worthwhile us just going into a little bit more detail around that. So as you can see, a BC1 athlete is that, that of an athlete that has a neurological condition um, and this severe impairment is going to affect all four limbs. They're going to be a power chair user in most cases, and you might see them having straps and other postures to support to help maintain um, their posture whilst they're playing. And when this athlete is throwing, you're probably likely to see that they're going to have some difficulty in releasing the ball um, and that they may hold the ball in a variety of ways, just due to how much control they have within their hand. We then move on to the BC2 athlete. And again, this athlete is um, going to have a neurological condition and again, affecting all four limbs with their throwing arm showing a significant impairment. These athletes, however, might be able to propel themselves in a manual wheelchair and maybe even stand or walk for short distances. And you're likely here, unlike that of a BC1, to see some control of their trunk and they may be able to adjust their position in their chair when they get into their throne position. So you're likely to see the hand and the grip um, are still effective, affected, sorry, but they're, they're going to be able to manipulate that ball and have some kind of increased hand function. So it looks slightly smoother as they release that ball into the field of play. We then move on to a BC3. So for this classification, we see athletes with a neurological and non-neurological condition. And all four limbs again are gonna be affected, including the trunk. So they're most likely to be a power chair user um, and they cannot walk or propel a manual wheelchair um, walking if they can is going to be done um, not unaided. For these athletes they might fit the profile of a BC1 or a BC4 player but they're unable to hold that ball so if you were to ask them to hold a, a botch ball it's something that they're going to be unable to do so they're likely to fit the profile of a BC3 and they can't throw the ball if they are able to hold it any further than five meters consistently um, and they'll demonstrate to you the fact that they can't hold or grip a ball and release it into the field of play. So these, as the picture shows, will require the ramp and the ramp assistant. And then we move on to our last classification of the BC4. So athletes here fit the profile with a non-neurological condition. Again, all four limbs are affected. These athletes may be able to propel a manual wheelchair over short distances, and they're gonna have some level of trunk control, but they're likely to be affected by fatigue. And you'll see that as they start playing um, and throughout a match. So as we said, they're gonna lack strength, um, which is where, where the fatigue would be shown in their limbs. And they may have a weakness in their hand and fingers, which make gripping the ball slightly hard, but there is still that ability to manipulate it. And you might see that there's um, uh, almost powers generated by it, by a practice swing, and that's how they might release the ball into the field of play. So hopefully that just gives you a, a small snippet as to what does a, a botcher player look like. And as we say, it might be something that we're able to, to discover another time, um, but that's not the focus of our session tonight. So we then move on to regional classification. And this is a guide um, that athletes will use before national classification. And this is really to check that an athlete's self-classification is correct. So an athlete will be invited to a regional classified event at the earliest opportunity. And this will be in place until they can be nationally classified. And this is performed by at least a panel of one being a national classifier that's either technical or medical. So, for example, in this case, either Fran or myself would be able to carry this out. And this involves an athlete evaluation, which is an individual assessment followed by being observed in competition. And this is done in the same competition where possible. Athletes will be issued with confirmation of classification upon completion of their athlete evaluation. And it's probably important to know as a coach that failure to, um, for your player to attend this classification appointment might make them ineligible to compete. So if they're invited to be classified and they've obviously got this appointment in place we need to make sure we do everything we can to, for them to make that appointment so it doesn't hinder them in competition so um national classification um in the same way that international classification um would overrule national classification 
the the decision of at national classification would overall regional classification and i guess alongside all of that um whether it be self classification or regional classification um i think it's just an expectation that obviously there's there's no expectation that coaches and athletes will necessarily self classify in the right categories um it's to get an idea and I think then the, the, the regional classification and the national classification adds that clarity to it. Um, so the national classification, it aims to mirror the international federation rules. And these are, um, like we mentioned earlier, based on the IPC rules, um, but specific to Botcher. So what we're trying to do is make sure that what happens at a national classification is as similar as possible to what would happen at an international classification. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more depth in the next slides of the sort of steps around the classification and what they look like. Um, but there's a minimal eligibility criteria and um, there's an athlete evaluation and there's a medical diagnosis. The panel at national classification will always have at least two people on it. And one of them must be um, a medical classifier, so either a physio or a doctor. Um, and again, the athlete will get confirmation of what their classification is following on from the classification. So as we mentioned there, the three steps of classification um, is medical diagnosis, um, the athlete evaluation and observation in competition. We'll go on to those in depth and we'll just, uh, yeah, we'll move on pretty quickly, I think, through that slide. Um, in, the, in the national classification process, um, the, an athlete will be allocated a sports class um, and that happens the ideal way for that to happen is prior to a competition taking place. So endeavour to have classification appointments um, before any of the competition starts so that athletes can be uh, observed in the competition and that they start off the competition in the right classification. Um, some sports don't have observation and competition, but in boxer it really is quite a crucial, crucial part of the classification process. So if we go on to the next slide. So the first step um, is where we look at the, um, the medical diagnosis. So with this step, athletes are required to submit a certificate of diagnosis. Um, there's, a, there's a form that, uh, that's filled in and that again mirrors what is done by the International Federation. Um, that confirms your diagnosis um, and it must be signed by a doctor um, to, to say that, so that we know that that's what your diagnosis is and um, that's been confirmed. There's six different eligible impairments, which we'll have a look at on the next slide. So we'll pop onto that one now. So again, these, el these eligible impairments come from the um, international Paralympic Committee, so they're across all all sports. The six that are up there are the ones that are um, most well. Th these are the ones that we use in butcher, and there's a couple of other eligible impairments which aren't represented within butcher. So um, there's also short short stature and VI athletes, which at the moment in Paralympic pathway for butcher um, athletes with those impairments wouldn't classify. Um, so impaired muscle power, this must be due to an underlying health condition um, and it's got to be a permanent health condition. So I guess a, a little example around that is someone who's had a had a, a sort of a temporary back injury um, might feel weakness. But with that, with that not being an underlying health condition, that wouldn't classify uh, as impaired muscle power. So examples are spinal cord injuries, which is obviously a long-term serious back injury, um, and sp spina bifida. Um, also, we see in Botcher athletes with muscular dystrophy who would fit into that eligible impairment. There's an impaired passive range of movement um, where one or more joint can't move full its through its full range. 
So examples of that would be arthrogryposis, which we obviously see athletes with that condition in butcher. Um, then there's limb deficiency, where um, part of a bone or a joint is missing, um, and that can be through traumatic circumstances or it can be congenital, so something that's present from, from birth. And then the bottom three that we've got on there um, are all related to tone. Um, so you've got hypertonia, um, which is an increase in muscle tension um, due to a neurological condition. Um, might be due to a condition such as cerebral palsy or a brain injury. Um, you've got ataxia, which is a lack of coordination of muscle movements. Um, again, quite often seen in someone who's got a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or brain injury. And you've got athetosis, which is characterised by lots of involuntary movements and difficulty maintaining one posture. Um, again, you, you often see that in athletes who have got a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or a brain injury. Um, so the, the letter of diagnosis will confirm those impairments and it should be a fairly straightforward process um, because it's fairly clear from those criteria uh, what the conditions are and that it must be due to an underlying health criteria. Um, so this will be reviewed by the medical classifier and sometimes um, the medical classifier may go back and ask for more information. If that's the case, it's the athlete's um, responsibility to provide that. It's not up to the, the, the classifying panel to try to fi find more information. It's up to the athlete to try and provide that. So step step two, once kind of uh, the, the, you've confirmed that there's an eligible impairment, um, is actually the athlete evaluation. Um, so in this, the classifiers will be looking if an athlete meets a minimum impairment criteria. Um, so that that is within each classification category that Liz went through before, there are really specific um, sort of tests that we do um, to see if it's to see if an athlete will meet meet those criteria. So they're lined out around whether they're to, to do with strength or whether they're to do with tone. Um, and if an athlete meets that minimum parent criteria, then then they can be considered for classification in in that in that group. So your eligible impairment will guide you a little bit as to what group you're looking at. So the ones that we talked about, which were uh, are to do with tone, you'd be looking at athletes who might fit into a BC1 or a BC2 category. And obviously athletes where strength is their main difficulty, you'd be looking at BC4. Um, it's really important, I think, at this point to realise that um, some athletes who have genuine impairments, to have genuine disabilities, won't meet minimum impairment criteria for botcher. And that doesn't mean that their impairment or their disability is any less genuine. It just means that within the criteria laid out in butcher, they don't meet that eligibility. There might be other sports that are suitable for that athlete, um, or there might be other opportunities within butcher, but not within a Paralympic pa pathway of BC1 to BC4. Oh, next slide. Thank you. So yeah, to, to assess that minimum impairment criteria, the medical classifier on a team will go through a series of different tests looking at um, what an athlete can do. So it might be gross motor movements, looking at walking, um, transferring, um, propelling a wheelchair. There might be some things around balance. Um, we may well ask an athlete to get out of their wheelchair as part of the classification process because a lot of things around um, balance and posture and sometimes joint range of movement you can't assess properly um, from a wheelchair um, we'll look at coordination and how an athlete can manage certain coordination tasks and muscle strength testing or spasticity testing which is where we look really specifically at muscle tone Excellent. So once we have um, all of that information, we then need to determine which sport class an athlete, if they fit the profile, they should compete in. 
And this is determined, as Fran said, from the medical eligibility and that minimum impairment criteria. So this would be carried out by and confirmed by a technical classifier. And here the focus would be on um, dexterity and grasp, upper limb and lower limb, trunk control and coordination, how the athlete throws, kicks or releases the ball. And they're going to be given a provisional sport class to enter the competition. So this really compares an athlete's physical assessment and how it's presented in the sporting activity, which obviously in this case is within Boccia. And then from that, all athletes um, need to be observed in competition. And this is probably one of the final aspects um, of the classification evaluation. So all athletes will be observed and there'll be a real assessment as to how their functional impair impact of their impairment affects them playing boccia. And this will then determine their final sport class. And as I said, all athletes of boccia must be observed in competition to have this. Okay, so what is the sports class status and how does that sort of work and what does that mean? Um, so an athlete who's not been, not had a national classification would be classed as a new athlete when they present for classification for the first time. There's then, once they've, uh, once they've met the criteria for having an eligible impairment and the minimum impairment criteria in the athlete evaluation, they then would be have a sports class status for a short time after they've been observed in competition they're very likely to get that review um class status um so every athlete that's seen for the first time will be seen again for another classification and that's just because um it's it's good to get kind of two views on each athlete and make sure that the first panel um, have seen everything that that athlete can do. Um, sometimes it's because it's quite a young athlete and they may have developed and matured um, between classifications, um, and it and it's good to see how that's affected their abilities. Um, so that will that will happen for pretty much every athlete will be reviewed again for a different classification and some athletes will are, are at that review classification been given a sports class status of review fixed date so that can be used for a number of reasons by the classification panel um to see an athlete again it might be that the the nature of their condition is changing um so the the panel thinks it'd be worthwhile um being observed again it might be because they're seeing some um things which are sort of fluctuation or different with that athlete um and they think actually a, a different panel having another, having another look at that athlete at a later date would be useful then um athletes some athletes may get a confirmed status um and this is where they've been seen once and then reviewed um they've got a condition which is stable and the classification panel are happy um, that they don't need to be seen again for classification. Cool. So the final, I suppose, classification status, status that you can have would be a non-eligible athlete. So like we mentioned there, at any stage in this process, um, the, the classification panel may feel that an athlete doesn't meet any of the criteria, uh, any one of the criteria that's been set out. That's certainly not disagreeing that the athlete has a disability or an impairment, but it's just recognising that that impairment or disability doesn't fit the criteria laid out um, for Boccia. Um, so if that does happen to an athlete, then I guess it's about looking at if there's different opportunities available to them within Boccia and uh, or if there's different sports that they may want to try at that, at that time. That bottom point there um, just talks a, a little bit around um, the ability of an athlete to be seen again. So an athlete, if an athlete is made non-eligible by one classification panel, then they will be automatically seen by a protest panel um, where a second is basically getting a second opinion to make sure that the first panel has, has, has seen everything right with that athlete. Cool. So um, 
with the rev- with the review status athletes, um, there's th- those athletes will either be seen um, after twelve months if they've presented as a new athlete. Then there should be twelve months between that first classification and then the review classification. For the athletes that are given a fixed date review, that should be confirmed whether the panel thinks that it's worthwhile reviewing in twelve months, in twenty four months, or you know, it can be up to kind of four or five years on that. An athlete can request to be reviewed again if there is a change to their medical condition. So if they can confirm that their medical condition is of a deteriorating nature and um, that that the condition has deteriorated and they want to be reviewed, or if they've been given a new diagnosis um, or something has changed with their diagnosis, then they can also request um, a review based on their medical condition. Um, then the bottom point about the progressive nature, I think we've covered with the review fixed date and the review. So the question of how often are athletes classified? It's at least two times, but it's an ongoing process. So it could be more than two times. Excellent. And then as we try and bring this back into how do you support as a coach or maybe as an official or a teacher or a parent or so on as we've, we've learned tonight, it's really about making sure that you have that basic understanding. So hopefully this um, presentation has allowed you to have an opportunity to, to have a kind of a first introduction to classification and the process behind it within Boccia. Um, as a coach, it's really important to signpost athletes and support their support network, whether that's a parent, a personal assistant, anyone who's with them to where they can get their appropriate education from regarding classification. So obviously this is going to then ensure that athletes understand what classification is, the process involved and what to expect when going for a national classification. As I think I mentioned at the start, we're really trying to make classification a positive experience. So the more information an athlete knows before they even attend a classification, the better, because then they're going to have their expectations managed um, around what's happening. So maintaining communication with an athlete and that support personnel so that they can raise questions around classification, ask questions and share experiences at national level. It's always great when people are happy to share a positive experience that they've had of classification and how well the process has worked and so on, because then it gives others the confidence in in knowing that when they're going to be called from regional to national, what to expect. And then ensuring athletes are actively involved in the process. So really making sure that it's the athletes that are asking the question, the athlete really understands what what is the process, what is the structure, what is the reason behind this, so that they're fully involved and they can really present themselves um, as a true representation when being classified. And then finally, supporting athletes with their expectations around classification. So just making sure that they're aware, as we've said before, exactly what's going to happen, what do these sports statuses mean, how often might they be classified and so on. Yeah, and I think with that last point as well, it's about, um, you know, making sure that obviously when you're self-classifying, you're, you, you are making an opinion that based on the best knowledge that you have. So you, you, are, you are making your best effort with that. Um, we don't expect everyone to be classifiers. And that's why we have a classification process. Um, so I think particularly when new athletes come in for a first classification, that understanding of um, that we've we've self-classified as this because this is based on our knowledge and the best that we can do. But that is subject to change when you come in to see classifiers um, and just managing expectations around that, really. And that's everything from us. Yeah, so we've got obviously time for questions if anyone wants to um come on and ask a question or if you want to type questions into the chat box um then that's great as well rather than come on and speak i'll hi. kick us off oh gone on. gone on then bob so sorry hi it's bob here um yeah that bottom point there fran and liz support athletes with their expectations around classification I think as a coach, it's also important not to give them false hope. Um, you know, I think, you know, if an athlete says, oh, I'm, I'm definitely a BC1, I'm definitely a BC1, 
and and you think well you might be a bc2 so you know not to build it's not it's not about building their hopes up but just the realism of of, of classification is is sometimes not not exactly what the initial thoughts are yeah absolutely i think that's that's such a good point um and i think the, the video touched on a little bit um that the ability to be competitive in a sport is shouldn't shouldn't be about classification it should be about your training your coaching your tactics um and your ability to to improve so i, I again i think you know a new athlete coming into a sport um may may feel that when they first start playing um that it's quite hard for them um and i think those other aspects of um training getting to know the sport and the processes and things like that really come in at that point as well um and yeah being being competitive is not just around which class you're put into it's it's all about it's also about everything that goes with with playing sport and training for a sport yeah it's also about um if an athlete is reclassified i've, I've had a couple of athletes that i work with that, that have been reclassified prior prior to the covid um, lockdown etc uh, is, is being able to talk to them in a positive way you know and saying you know because they they do get athletes do get reclassified because their impairment changes and they can get downhearted and again i think it's about talking to the athlete and saying look just because you've gone from a bc1 to a two or from two to a four or whatever it is um, you know, it's not. It, it's it's because things within you have changed, or your abilities changed. Absolutely. I'm just going to read out a question here from Georgina. Um, why do we think there are very few BC fours in nationals? You're always in such a small group. Unfortunately, we don't recruit athletes to classify. We have to wait for them to present themselves um, within competitions, but. I know within home nations there are recruitment, um, there is recruitment activity going on to try and identify new BC4s coming into the system. Yeah, definitely. I don't, I, I don't think there is a, a simple answer to that. I think it would be great to see more BC4s. Um, and I, I don't know wh whether it's just related to the impairment types that come into that um, group. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it it would definitely be great to have more BC fours around. So, one one feedback I've had on that point, uh, Fran, is that because BC fours, you know, can be slightly more able in some respects, they they tend to to generate towards other sports. I mean, one sport that that I've heard a lot of the BC potential BC fours go to is wheelchair football. Um, for whatever reason, I mean, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to play boxer, but uh, <laughs> that's just my bias. But um, yeah, I mean, Georgina's right. But you, the, you know, BC fours, we need them. Get your friends involved, Georgina. <laughs> and then a question from Sue saying around the difficulty of athletes would be in a BC eight to come to regional and sometimes national competitions. And they don't really fit in with the power classifications. And I think as well, the BC8 is such a wide category that, you know, it, it's huge in itself, everybody's ability in the BC8. Other people might not know what that is, but in Special Olympics, that would refer to someone with an intellectual disability. Yeah, and I think each kind of home country operate slightly different in that respect when when Fran mentioned then about um being not eligible for the BC one to four each home country has um I suppose a breadth of opportunities for those that fit fit out of that of those four classifications so in England like like you rightly said Sue we have some competitions that that fit for BC eights and a few other yeah. disabilities um so it's just looking what's what's out there for the the players that are within within the networks that we're working with them um but i think yeah for the purpose of today we we're really just focusing on that on that paralympic pathway yeah i've realized that thank you <laughs> <laughs> 
I was just going to ask as well, um, just talking about how coaches can support, would it be commonplace for a coach to accompany an athlete to a classification appointment, like the evaluation, or what are the guidelines about who can come along with a with an athlete to support? Yeah, so um, with that one, an, an athlete can bring someone into the classification with them, and that's entirely their choice on, on who they bring in. So... Um, under 18s um have to bring someone in um but again that that can be their coach or it can be their parent um and anyone else has that option how would you classify they could come in on their on their own if they want to um and they can bring in um one person with them so it absolutely can be a coach and i think as classifiers sort of welcome a coach into the classification um i think it's just uh recognizing that that person is there to support the athlete um and you know if if the athlete needs help with asking questions and um putting across their point and things then absolutely the the coach or whoever is accompanying them can do that Uh, so we've got where would you classify someone with a neuromuscular condition? Um, so with that, I obviously don't want to go into too many specifics on this call, but l- likely to be um, looking if they would fit into a BC4 category, if they were able to grip and throw the ball, um, or obviously the BC3 category um, is can be athletes with a neuromuscular or a um or a neurological condition you sometimes hear as well of um players who are perhaps particularly new to the sport or uh you know and haven't been training a lot a great deal to begin with or or, or a bit further down the line when they're looking at strength and conditioning options, for example, there's sometimes a bit of a worry that by doing some of those oh, things, yeah, it potentially yeah. then might alter their classification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you what would you say yeah, to a player with those concerns? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think um, that classification, the process tries mm. to sort of level that out as much as possible. Um, so you, a, a, an athlete coming to classification will likely be pushed mm, pretty right. hard. Um, so to try to yeah. see um, like mm-hmm. their, their full ability and not just what they can do, but maybe try to uncover what their what what potential they've got as well. Um, so and then I th- I think that obviously athletes going away and and working on things and training is great and 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 I guess once you've it is really hard with new athletes definitely as a classifier um to try to work out what might be improved with um with coaching and by playing more um and I think certainly my experience as a classifier sometimes you know on occasion I have people who have come in um and have classified themselves as a BC3, but actually have quite a good potential to be able to throw. So we would encourage them to go away and, and practice on that. Um, so I think hopefully at that, at that regional classification level, um, we can do enough to work out what potential people have got um, and to classify them uh, kind of based on that as well. Um, I'd love to say that you can't train yourself out of a classification. And I think classification is set up to try to stop that from happening. But I think there'll always be, um, there'll always be kind of an outlier to the rule really on that. Um, And obviously someone who's very deconditioned, hasn't done any training, new into a sport and then starts a, um, you know, has a massive transformation with a regime um, you, you, I can't say that would never happen, um, but I do think that with using the eligible impairments, the minimal impairment criteria and um, that combination, I suppose, between 
the technical classifier and their knowledge of how an athlete might develop and change and what their potential is with the medical knowledge um hopefully it's few and far between that happens because i'd never discourage an athlete from um kind of working to be a, a better version of themselves as a watcher player but yeah good question <laughs> Just throwing it out there to everyone else then, how do you guys as coaches think that your players feel about classification? Is it an area that they understand or are you hoping to educate them on yourselves? Do they find it daunting? You know, what are your, what are your thoughts? Hi, it's Bob again. <clears throat> again. <laughs> For me, I mean, having taken over lead coach at the academy, um, I mean, athletes do get, quite uptight about classification you know when when we go to competitions and classification they've been called for classification they do sweat and panic there's no question about that because I think they think there's some I don't know they think there's a, almost a magic formula that the classifiers have got to catch them out and that's not the case as we know um I mean at some point I you know um I will remind the athletes you know, that classification will be happening. I think there was a big push just before lockdown, if I'm right, Natalie, for a lot of classifications to be done. I know there's two or three athletes that are that we work with that, that are in, in waiting. And it, again, it's back to what I said earlier. It's reassuring them, just reminding them, you know, that there isn't a magic formula. This is the process. This is what you go through. You know, um, and it's it's to improve the sport. And I think I think probably with that, as someone who's supporting an athlete through classification, um, yeah, the, definitely that reminder of you know classifiers ultimately want to get as many people playing butcher as possible, um, and what we want to do is is to try to make the impact of your impairment mean that you can play in a fair category um and be as competitive as, as possible um and i guess I, and i think sort of it's about being really open about the classification process in that the way it's set up in that you come in for an evaluation and then you're observed in competition hopefully that discourages people from from i suppose um misrepresenting themselves in an athlete evaluation um and that's 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 the kind of uh i guess how how the process is used to to help with that because we absolutely want to see athletes showing the best they can be so that early on we can get them into the right classification so athletes sort of coming in and um and, and demonstrating their abilities um, I think is is really important um, and yeah and hopefully you know like Liz said with sharing positive experiences um, always happy to talk about what a classification looks like to try and help manage um, that anxiety that athletes come in with because um, yeah I w sort of definitely understand it's not the um, it's not the greatest environment I think to come into and have someone that you don't really know putting you through all these tests. Just a question I've got uh, regarding the comp competition um, observations. Do you tell the athlete which which match you're observing, or, or and if you do, you know, why why do you tell them, and if you don't, why do you not tell them? Um, so we don't tell the athletes because we can we we may observe more than one match. Okay, um, and we may observe something um it, you know we may observe something in a match that we hadn't necessarily planned to watch which makes us watch a little bit more of that um I think it's a I guess it's we'd like to be as subtle as possible as to not affect what the athlete's doing by having a classifier standing at the end of the court it's not always possible um because sometimes you need to be in a certain position to to get a good view 
um and sometimes the, i guess just the nature of the of the venues mean that you you're pretty obvious as you're walking around um and i guess um we so we do, so we don't tell athletes because that may that may change um what match that we that we decide to watch and if we say we're going to come and watch you in this match and then we don't that may lead to more anxiety and i guess the other reason we don't say anything is that we may watch more than one game um we may watch parts of different games um so as not to kind of i suppose cause confusion of you're expecting a classifier and they don't turn up okay thanks and i think the the key thing there is that if you've got the confidence in your athlete and again you've managed those expectations and you've said to your athlete you know, this is your opportunity just to present yourself as as honestly as you can. You have absolutely nothing to worry about because all we're doing is trying to make sure that the person that we've seen in the classification room is the same person on the court because at times the two don't match up. And when we go back to the reason why we classify to make it fair, obviously that's not then fair on other athletes. So that's all we're doing, just trying to create this fair sport that, as Fran said, that athletes are in the right classification competing against each other. Yeah, and I think it goes, it kind of goes both ways on that, in that sometimes an athlete will come into the evaluation and they're very sort of worried and um, like find it really hard to, to do what we're, what we're asking. And then on court, so on court, you see something slightly different. Um, and equally, you, you might see you know an athlete in and some athletes come into an athlete evaluation and they're actually very relaxed they're not playing botcher they're not under any pressure um and you can sometimes see a lot more and then when you see them on court and they've got the pressure of throwing to a real specific target with um you know the 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 sort of the added pressure of that they might win or lose that you see a slightly different athlete in in those situations so I think there's both sides um with the with the differences between evaluation and observation if if you do a classification and, and an athlete is reclassified let's say for argument's sake they go from a bc2 to a bc5 at a competition when does that bc5 classification kick in is it instantly or is it at the start of the next competition? What what's the time scale on 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 a on a reclassification rather than a new classification? Um, Matt, do you do you want to answer that one? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I think it 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 basically depends on the competition guidelines and essentially sometimes at which point you are in the competition versus as to whether it will come into play during that competition or the following one and and therefore that might vary between again home countries different competition organizers I would say that doesn't really give you an answer but is that information posted because I mean I've, I've known not not in recent years but of, of athletes that have been had a reclassification during a competition and effectively been told that's it you can't can't go on anymore I mean, I haven't heard of it, you know, recently, but a couple of occasions in the past. I think qualification criteria might depend on other factors, as in how many individuals have, are in certain pools and things. So it's a bit more complicated than just looking at that isolated classification or reclassification okay. incident. But particularly for England, Bob, I can check and get a bit more information from Rachel and come back to you on that with some more yeah some more information. yeah it's, I mean I, I you know I'm not I'm not in a position with any athletes at the moment but you know I want I, as Liz said if you know if as coaches we're prepared and I can say to an athlete you know this is potentially what you know what 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 the situation is yeah it, or at least the scenarios that could happen it's useful to to understand that before yeah, you're at the competition back to that yeah. reassurance thing isn't it you know yeah. managing expectations yeah, so yeah. If, if it is at all possible, we will try and complete classification by the end of group stages before um, athletes go into any knockouts. It's not just logistically, it's sometimes not always possible to, to do that. And I suppose that's where the, where the differences perhaps come in. 
Um, but but it, yeah, if we if we can as a classifier, we would observe people in group in the group stages. So if you reclassify an athlete in a group stage, does that mean they can't then go on and do the knockouts? That's where it probably depends on the competition. Okay, which goes back to what Natalie said. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think the scenario here, though, really highlights as a coach or as encouraging your athlete, obviously, who's at the heart of all of this, to really have awareness of, of who's the point of contact within your home nation who you should speak to. So as we've already identified, classification varies from home nation to home nation. So if you as a coach or a player are aware, OK, classification is coming up. What do I need to know? Where am I going to find that information? that's going to really help you either find these answers or just manage those expectations as we keep coming back to. Yeah, and to add to that, I know certainly in England, and this will spread to the other home countries as well, we're trying to do quite a lot of work now in updating our documentation, our communications, all, all supporting uh, classification, just to help improve that uh, athlete education. Um, so hopefully you'll see more content being released to, to support the process but at, at any point if you see something on one of our websites that you think could maybe could be presented a little bit better or or some areas that we're missing in terms of communication then certainly come come forward to us because we are as I say striving to improve the communication in general around the process just to make it easier more understandable and I suppose overall less less daunting as well. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> just going back to what Natalie was saying earlier about how the players feel no in Northern Ireland at the minute because we don't really have any classifiers here. Uh, players don't really get a classification until they're at national level. So I think that whole understanding of it becomes really important because it's not like a, you know, it's not going into that introduction of one panel that you're going straight into the national level with two and much more rigorous process I think that's something that we are working on about what our classification process looks like and it's I suppose getting players prepared for that and knowing what to expect I was just thinking how long normally does the uh, player assessment part take just in case anyone's asking me um, I think it's it's probably around 30 minutes um, it, to do a full go through everything. It can be shorter than that, but it's probably 30 minutes is probably about the maximum that it is. And just to add to that, what for those that have never seen, I suppose, a, a classification evaluation before where what's the environment like where does it take place is it is it always on a court is it in a separate room or does it vary could you tell us a bit about that yeah so I guess it it does vary in an absolute ideal world um it would be in a, in a private room that's big enough to have a full botch of court in it um but I think with classification there's always a little um there's probably a, a little bit of compromise around we want to get athletes playing um and support the competition um so we'd certainly would want um privacy so that you're far enough away from other people that obviously when you're having conversations we can't hear that so if it if it is in in a hall with other people then um you know having screens up um would be it would be really good but yeah the ideal circumstance is that it's in a private room away from other people and that you've got um at least a botch of court um of space in there um and and that's because we need to be able to see what people are like with covering a, a whole court and you know for generating power and and throwing a ball um the full the kind of full length of a, of a court it and like I said we we will get athletes out of their wheelchairs in classification and I think that's probably um that can sometimes raise an eyebrow um so as kind of coaches and, and people supporting athletes through classification making them aware that that is fairly likely to happen um now obviously if we ask an athlete 
um, can you get out of your wheelchair? And that, you know, the athlete comes back and said, well, if I use a hoist, then um, then we probably wouldn't be in those circumstances. So not to worry athletes that they're going to be made to do things that they can't do, um, but just that if they are able to, then being able to see how an athlete transfers, if they can walk and what that looks like is really useful to do as well. Um, so again, we need space for that. Um, and we may well have, um, you know, get ask an athlete to sit on an alternative surface, so to sit onto a bench or onto a chair, because um, quite often lots of wheelchairs will have lots of different support in, in around them. So get an athlete to sit onto something where they don't have that support if they're able to, um, get, gets us lots of really good information. Um, so, so, yeah, it is sometimes done in in kind of a competition hall but it, that should be relatively quiet so before other games have started um or the kind of the day before as well to try to to keep the privacy if at any point an athlete's in a situation that they don't feel comfortable um with then i think um we're really open for someone telling us that and then we can try and work with the organizers of the competition to find an alternative but i think sometimes there is that just little bit of balance of ensuring that the classification can happen and that the competition can happen um, and upholding the standards of classification as much as possible. And whilst it might seem obvious, one of the, the kind of two key things that an athlete will be asked to bring is their playing chair and botcher equipment, um, which obviously is, is how we observe them uh, releasing and propelling that ball. So it's always worthwhile having the, the letter that's maybe sent to the athlete or just having that awareness that these are things that will be needed um, to, to save time when you go in, that you might be asked to go and collect them quickly. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, no, de definitely. <laughs> the athletes who turn up um, without without their, their playing chair is, is a fun one. Um, but and, and yeah, and before the classification starts, the athlete will be taken through the consent form. So I know at some competitions they're sent out in advance so that people can read them and, and sign them. But if they if an athlete doesn't come with a consent form that's signed, then we will go through that with them to make sure that they're happy with everything as well. And okay. this is just maybe me not knowing the process uh, England use, but is that information usually on? Like, do they get an actual letter inviting the classification with that sort of information about balls and playing chair or? Yeah, again, we seem to have a lot of paper at the minute. We are reviewing it all and trying to see how we can um, streamline it, make it more efficient in terms of what we can put online and potentially get consent signed online beforehand so all a bit of a work in progress really Terry so I'll certainly share with you though when we're I'm, I'm sure I will have to your eyes don't worry <laughs> <laughs> sounds good <laughs> great well has anybody else got any more questions in the chat or if you want to pop off mute we've had a good half an hour chat there so we got through quite a bit everyone looks pretty happy well, we'll um, we'll call it a night then, I think, unless Liz and Fran want to wrap up with anything else. No, just thanks thanks for coming. Oh, I'm always happy to chat classification. So, um, and I think the the more it's made into a um, you know an open topic that people talk about um, and ask questions on, the the better. So I think there is no silly questions. Um, so yeah, just thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for your contributions. I'll follow up with the slides, like I said, and yeah, keep in touch. Thanks. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks. See you. ya. Cheers. Bye.